Better get thoroughly warm. Oh, thank you. I'll see about your room. Um, it's a rather cold room, I'm afraid, because it faces north, but all the others are occupied. So you have several other guests then? Yes, there's <laughs> Mrs. Boyle, and Major Metcalf, and Miss Casewell, and a young man named Christopher Wren, and now, you. Yes, the unexpected guests, the guests you did not invite, the guests who just arrived, out of the storm. Sounds quite dramatic, does it not? <laughs> Who am I? You do not know. Where do I come from? You do not know. Me? I am the man of mystery. <laughs> but now, I tell you this. From now on, there will be no more arrivals and no departures either. By tomorrow, even already, <laughs> you are cut off from civilization. No butcher, no baker, no milkman, no postman, no daily papers, no one, and nothing but ourselves. That is admirable. <laughs> admirable. Do not suit me better. My name, by the way, is Para Vincini. Oh yes, ours is Ralston. Mr. and Mrs. Ralston. And this is Monswell Manor Guest House. Yes, a Monswell Manor Guest House. Oh, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Depends. 
I've got some business to see to. When it is done, I shall go back. To France? No. Italy? No. <laughs> just now. This is Mrs. Ralston speaking. Who? The Berkshire Police. Oh, yes. Yes, Superintendent Hogbin, but I'm afraid that's impossible. He'd never get here. We're snowed up, completely snowed up. The roads are impassable and nothing can get through. Yes. Very well. But what? Hello? Hello? Molly, do you know there's another spade? Giles, the police have just gone up. Trouble with the police, eh? Serving liquor without a license. They're sending out an inspector or a sergeant or something. Oh, but, he, but he'll never get here. That's what I told him. They seemed quite confident that he would. Nonsense. Even a jeep couldn't get through today. Anyway, what's it all about? That's what I asked. <coughs> she wouldn't say. She said I was to impress upon my husband to listen very carefully to what Sergeant Trotter, I think it was, had to say, and to follow his instructions implicitly. Isn't it, isn't it extraordinary? What on earth do you think we've done? She could get those nylons from Gibraltar. I did remember to get the wireless license, didn't I? Yes, it's in the kitchen dresser. I had a rather near shave with the car the other day, but it was entirely the other fellow's fault. He must have done something. It's probably got something to do with running this place. I expect we've ignored some tin pot regulation of some ministry or other. You practically can't avoid it nowadays. I wish we'd never started this place. We're going to be snowed up for days and everyone is cross. We shall go through all our reserve of tins. Cheer up, darlings. Everything's going all right at the moment. I've filled up all the coal scuttles and brought in the wood and stoked the arbor and done the hens. And I'll go and do the boiler next and chop some kindling. You know, Molly, come to think of it. 
It's got to be something pretty serious to send a police sergeant checking out on all this. It must be something really urgent. Ah, there you are, Mr. Ralston. Are you aware that the central heating in the library is practically stone cold? I'm so sorry, Mrs. Boyle. We're a bit short of coke. I am paying seven guineas a week here. Seven guineas, and I do not want to freeze. I'll go and serve it up. Mrs. Ralston, if you do not mind me saying so, that is a very peculiar man you have staying here. His manners and his ties, and, well, does he ever brush his hair? He is an extremely brilliant young architect. I beg your pardon? Christopher Wren is an architect. My dear young woman, I have naturally heard of Sir Christopher Wren. Of course he was an architect. He built St. Paul's. You young people seem to think that no one is educated but yourselves. I meant this Wren. His name is Christopher. His parents called him that because they hoped he'd become an architect. And he is. Or nearly one, so it turned out all right. Sounds a fishy story to me. I should make some inquiries if I were you. What do you know of him? Just as much as I know about you, Mrs. Boyle. Which is that you're both paying us seven guineas every week. That's all I really need to know, isn't it? And all that concerns me. Doesn't matter to me whether I like my guests or whether I don't. You are young and inexperienced, so should welcome advice from anyone more knowledgeable than yourself. And what about this foreigner? What about him? Well, you weren't expecting him, were you? To turn away a bona fide traveller is against the law, Mrs. Paul. You should know that. Why do you say that? Weren't you a magistrate sitting on the bench, Mrs. Boyle? All I say is that this Mr. Penny here, whatever he calls himself, seems to me to be quite Beware, dear lady. You talk it the devil, and here he is! <laughs> I came in on tiptoe, like this. <laughs> no one can hear me if I do not want them to. I find that very amusing. Indeed. Now, there was a young lady. Well, I must get hold of my letters. I'll see if it is a bit warmer in the drawing room. My charming hostess looks upset. What is it, my dear lady? Well, everything's rather difficult this morning because of the snow. Yes, snow makes things difficult, does it not? Or else it makes them easy. Yes, very easy. <laughs> Don't know what you mean. There's quite a lot you do not know. For one thing, I think you do not know very much about running a guest house. I dare say we don't. But we mean to make a go of it. Oh, bravo! Bravo! <coughs> I'm not such a very bad cook. You are without doubt an enchanting cook. May I give you a little word of warning, Mrs. Ralston? You and your husband mustn't be too trusting. Have you references with these guests of yours? Is that usual? I always thought people just I just came. It is advisable to know a little about the people who sleep under your roof. Take, for example, myself. I turn up saying my car is overturned in this snow drift. What do you know me? Nothing at all. I may be a thief, a robber, a fugitive from justice, a madman, even a murderer. <laughs> you see? And perhaps you know just as little as your other guests. As Mrs. Boyd goes, show you. The drawing room is far too cool to sit in, and I shall write my letters in here. Allow me to poke the fire for you. Excuse me, Miss Ralston, is your husband about? I'm afraid the pipes of the downstairs cloak are frozen. It's an awful day. First the police, and now police. The police, did you say? Yes. They bring up just now. Say so they're sending out an inspector or a sergeant, but I don't think he'll ever get here. Money cooks more than half stones in the price. Hello, is anything the matter? I hear the police are on their way here. Why? Oh, that's all right. No one will get here today. Why, the drifts must be five feet deep, and the roads are all baked up. No one will get here today. Are you Mr. Ralston? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Detective Sergeant Scott of Berkshire Police. Can I get these skis off and stow them somewhere? Go around that way to the front door, I'll meet you. Thank you, sir. I suppose this is what we pay our police force for, enjoying themselves at winter sports. But why did you call for the police, Mrs. Ralston? I didn't. Who is that man? Where did he come from? He passed the dining room window on skis. All of us know him looking terribly hearty. You may believe it or not, but that man is a policeman. A policeman! <laughs> skiing! <laughs> uh, this is... 
Detective Sergeant Trotter. Good afternoon. You can't be a sergeant. You're too young. Oh, I'm not quite as young as I look, madam. But terribly hearty. We'll store your skis away under the back steps. Thank you. Excuse me, Miss Ross. May I use your telephone? Of course, Miss Meta. He's very attractive, isn't he? I always think the policemen are very attractive. No brains. You can see that at a glance. Hello? Hello? Miss Rawson, this telephone is dead. Quite dead. She was all right about half an hour ago. Mine spun off the way to the snow, I suppose. <laughs> so we're quite cut off now. Quite cut off. That's funny, isn't it? I don't see anything to laugh at. No, indeed. <laughs> Private joke of my own. Shh, the sleuth is returning. Now we can get down to business. Mr. Ralston, Mrs. Ralston. <laughs> Would you like to see us alone? If so, we can go into the library. It's not necessary, sir. It'll save time if everyone's here. Now, if I might sit at this table. Do hurry up and tell us. What have we done? Done? Oh, it's nothing of that sort, madam. It's, it's actually something quite different. It's more a matter of police protection, if you understand me. Police protection? It relates to the death of Mrs. Lyon. Mrs. Marine Lyon of 24 Culver Street, London. West 2, she was murdered yesterday on the 15th instant. You may have heard or read about the case. Yes, I heard it on the wireless, the woman who was strangled. That's right, miss. Now, the first thing I want to know is if any of you were acquainted with this Mrs. Lyon. Never heard of her. You may have known her under the name of Lyon. Lyon wasn't her real name. She had a police record and her fingerprints were on file, so we were able to identify her without difficulty. Her name was Maureen Stannon. Her husband was a farmer, John Stannon, who resided at Longridge Farm, not very far from here. Longridge Farm? Isn't <coughs> that where those children were? Yes, in yes. Longridge Farm. Three children. That's right, miss. The Corrigans. Two boys and a girl. Brought before the court in need of care and protection. A home was found for them with Mr. and Mrs. Stanning at Longridge Farm. One of the children subsequently died of persistent ill treatment and criminal neglect. The case made a bit of a sensation at the time. Horrible. Mrs. Stannings was sentenced to terms of imprisonment. Stanning died in prison. Mrs. Stanning was duly released and, as I say, was found strangled yesterday at 24 Culver Street. Who did it? I'm coming to that now. A notebook was picked up near the scene of the crime. In that notebook was written two addresses. The first was 24 Culver Street. The second was Monksville Manor. What? Yes, sir. That's why Superintendent Hogman, on receiving this information from Scotland Yard, thought it imperative to send me out here to find out if you knew of any connection between this house and the business at Longridge Farm. There's nothing. Absolutely nothing. It must be a coincidence. But Superintendent Hogman doesn't think it's a coincidence, sir. He'd have come himself if it were in any way possible, but under the weather conditions, and as I can ski, he sent me with instructions to get full particulars of everyone in this household, to report back to him by telephone, and to take what means I thought fit necessary to ensure the safety of this household. Safety? What danger does he think we're in? Surely he's not suggesting that somebody is going to be killed here. I don't want to frighten any of the ladies, but frankly, yes, that was the idea. But why? That's what I want to find out from you. But the whole thing's crazy. <coughs> yes. It's because it's crazy that it's dangerous. Nonsense. I must say, it seems a bit far-fetched. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> Is there something you're not telling us, sir? Yes. Below the two addresses was written the words, Three Blind Mice. And on the dead woman's body was a paper. This is the first written on it. Below that was a bar of music and a picture of three little mice. The bar of music was to the tune of the nursery rhyme, Three Blind Mice. You all know how it goes. Three blind mice. Three, three. blind mice. See how they run. They all run out to the farmer's farm. It's horrible. There were three children and one died? Yes, the youngest, a boy of 11. What happened to the other two? The girl was adopted. We have not been able to trace her present whereabouts. The other boy would now be about 22 deserted from the army and has not been heard of since. According to the army psychiatrists, he was a schizophrenic. A bit queer in the head, that's to say. They think it was he who killed Mrs. Lyon, but for Stan. Yes. And that he will turn up here and try and kill someone. But why? Well, that's what I've got to find out from you. As the superintendent sees it, there must be some connection. Now, you state, sir, that you have no business at Longridge Farm. 
No. The same goes for you, madam? I, no. No connection. What about servants? Huh. We haven't any servants. That reminds me, Sergeant Trotter, would you mind if I went off to the kitchen? I'll be there if you want me. That's quite all right, Mrs. Johnson. Now, if I might get all your names, please. Oh, this is rather ridiculous. We are merely staying at the kind of hotel. We only arrived yesterday and we have nothing to do with this place. You plan to come here ahead of time, though? You all booked your rooms in advance? Well, yes, all except for Mr. Baravik Jean. My car overturned in a snowdrift. I see. What I'm getting at is that any one of you who's been planning to stay here might very well have been followed around. Now, there's just one thing I want to know, and I want to know it quick. Which one of you is it that has any business at Longridge Farm? You're not being very sensible, you know. One of you is in danger. Deadly danger. I've got to know which one that is. All right, I'll ask you one by one. You first, since you seem to arrive here more or less by accident, Mr. Paravincini. Para Paravincini. But, my dear inspector, I know nothing but nothing of what you are talking about. I am a mere stranger in this country. I know nothing of these local affairs of bygone years. Mrs. Boyle, I don't quite see why. I consider it rather an impertinence as to why I should have anything to do with such distressing business. Miss? Casewell, Leslie Casewell. I never heard of Longridge Farm and I know nothing about it. And you, sir? Metcalf, Major. Heard about the case in the papers at the time. <coughs> Station in Edinburgh, then. No personal knowledge. Then you? Christopher Wren. I was a mere child at the time. I don't remember even hearing about the case. And that's all you have to say? Any of you? Well, if one of you gets murdered, you'll have yourselves to blame. Now, if I might get a tour of the house, please. Oh, it's right this way. My dears, how melodramatic. He's very attractive, isn't he? I do admire the police. So stern and boiled. Quite a thrill, this whole business. Three blind mice. How does the tune go? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Really, Mr. Wren? Don't you like it? But it's a signature tune. The signature of the murderer. Just fancy what a kick he must be getting out of all this. Melodramatic rubbish, and I don't believe a word of it. Just you wait, Mrs. Boyle. Till I sneak up behind you. And you feel my hands around your back.